Uh, as I said, it's great to have you with us. A very warm welcome to all of you this evening. Uh, most of you know who I am. My name's Luke, um, Luke Giles. So I'm one of the pastors. Uh, Denzel is our speaker tonight. Denzel is a colleague, and uh, we're speaking on the on the theme of the image of God and what it means to be made in God's image. And so it's Engage Image this evening. And so we're very excited that you can join us for that. Uh, just an uh, opportunity for you just to say hi. We'll have at the end of the evening. So um, at the end of the evening, we'll unmute everybody and you can all sing to each other and wave to each other and talk to each other before we go. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, suggestions. Uh, if, you, if you do have bandwidth and you're not prone to nodding off, uh, do try and keep your video on. Uh, it just, just actually helps the speaker quite a lot to be able to uh, engage to faces rather than blank screens. So if able to, uh, that would be a great help. Uh, I find personally, uh, when I do Zoom meetings like this, using the speaker option is a better option. So just uh, the speaker will come up. So uh, if you have got that as a facility, that's usually better. Uh, just to mention to you that we're going to do a split screen. Uh, that is that there'll be a video, uh, not a video, PowerPoint presentation. So your screen will split uh, into the screen of, of the host and well as the speaker. Just bear in mind that you can change the sizing on your computer screen. Uh, so you don't have to have a big PowerPoint and a small little Denzel. You can change it to suit you. Um, and then, as I said, we'll, we'll control the volume from our side. Uh, basically, what that means is we've muted all of you and we'll unmute you at the end uh, before we go. As many of you know, the idea is that we, we're interactive. So what will happen is Denzel will speak to us for a little while. Um, and then the idea is that we'll have a Q&A following that. So if you've got questions, uh, please feel free to message them into us. Uh, best way is if you're on Zoom to use the, the chat facility and either message to me privately or put it onto the, onto the, 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 the chat board. Uh, and we'll try and, and process those questions. And then I think, I've never been on there, but apparently uh, YouTube also has a facility that you can send stuff through to us. And so Michael will be, be monitoring the YouTube questions as well. So the idea is that, that you engage with us on the questions that you might have uh, flowing from Denzel's talk. Maybe let him, uh, let him talk for a little while before you send the questions, just so that we, we've got something to base the questions on. Uh, so that's the plan for the evening. I'm looking at you. It looks like uh, your seats are all in the upright position. Looks like you're all ready to go. Just uh, two uh, notices for TCC folk. Uh, just a happy birthday to Brian Moyles. It's his birthday today. So celebrations to him. And then I did see that Susan Makura had joined us. So just condolences to Susan. Uh, her sister-in-law passed away earlier this week. So we do just extend condolences to Susan and the family. Um, those are, are some of the news. I, I guess most of you are aware from this morning about the wedding yesterday. And um, uh, so that's all the news I've got. I'm going to pray for us. And then I'm going to read the Bible for us. And then, um, and then I'm going to hand over to my brother Denzel. But let's pray first. Let me, let me lead us in a time of prayer. Just a moment of quiet. And then I'll pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much uh, for the opportunity for us just to connect in this way. Uh, we are uh, grateful that we can do so, even though it's remotely, even though it's on a virtual platform. Uh, we are grateful, Lord, for the technology that allows us just to engage with each other in this way. Uh, most importantly, we thank you for the opportunity to engage with you, our Creator and our Redeemer. And indeed, Lord, we do come before you tonight acknowledging you and worshipping you as the sovereign creator of the world. Uh, we acknowledge, Lord, your sovereignty and your power. Uh, Lord, we recognize, as we were reminded last week, that you spoke and creation came to be, and we thank you for that. Uh, we recognize, Lord, that you made all things according to your good purposes and your plans. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we saw last week that, 
that the creation of humanity was the high point, even though not the end point of creation. And we praise you, Lord, that you made all things good. Indeed, your scriptures tell us they were made very good because humanity chose to go their own way. And so we thank you that tonight we can worship you not just as our creator, but also as our redeemer. Uh, we're mindful that it was our own rebellion that led humanity out of the garden. And we're mindful of the promises in the scripture that you remain faithful to your plans and purposes. And so did not leave us without hope. Uh, we thank you for your promise of salvation and blessing made ultimately to Abraham, but fulfilled in Jesus. We thank you that because of Jesus, we can indeed have hope of forgiveness and restoration and we can look forward to being with you for all eternity in the new creation. My Father, we pray that as we spend some time tonight thinking about humanity particularly and how we've been made in your image and likeness, uh, we pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged afresh by your word. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would delight in our dignity and value as image bearers. And we pray, Lord, that we'd be reminded of our purpose for being in that we are your image bearers. And so we pray tonight, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. Uh, we do pray especially, Lord, for Denzel tonight. Uh, use him as your mouthpiece to speak to us and to encourage us and to bless us. Lord, all these things we pray and ask for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got a Bible with you, uh, won't you turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis? If you have your phones with you, your tablets with you, swipe, slide, turn, page, browse, whatever you need to do, uh, join us at Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read for us just a few verses from Genesis chapter 1 through to chapter 2 verse 3. I'm going to pick it up at Genesis 1, verse 26. Just a short section, Genesis 1, verse 26. So let's hear the word of God together. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were complete in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I'm going to hand over to Denzel, who needs no introduction, and he's going to take us from here. You have to unmute yourself, Denzel. Okay, you did, you did, or somebody did. Uh, thanks very much, Luke, for that introduction, and good evening, everyone. It's always lovely uh, to see your faces, even though it's on the screen. Uh, the aim of this Engage series uh, is to get us thinking and talking about the things our world is thinking and talking about, uh, just so that we can give a, a <laughs> response. Um, and, I, and I use the word response intentionally, uh, uh, not an answer, a response, 
Uh, I think an answer implies that that's it and case closed where we are concerned. Whereas a response is more likely uh, to be acceptable in a world where people are all over the place in their thinking and in their opinions. Besides, I think a response is more sensitive uh, to the question behind the question that they might ask. Uh, a, a response gives, uh, also a response gives opportunity uh, for further discussion. And that is really uh, what we want to, to do, especially with our unbelieving or uh, family and friends. We want to keep this discussion going of the things uh, of God. This evening, as you have heard, the topic is image, specifically uh, us being created in the image of God. So this is a biblical response, a response that is by no means exhaustive. Uh, you may want to do further reading and research uh, for yourself. I've only engaged with a couple of, with a couple of, of um, uh, authors on this. Uh, after I've spoken, as Luke said, uh, we will try and respond uh, to some of your questions. Now, uh, you may know that this is actually a, a big and a very crucial subject because of how it relates to so many aspects of humanity, uh, gender, uh, rule and dominion, uh, work, etc., etc. And I've discovered that, what happened now? Pardon me, pardon me. I've discovered that, um, that the Old, Old Testament does not say much uh, about the image of God. In fact, the concept is dealt with explicitly in only three, three passages, all from the book of Genesis. There are other uh, passages in the Bible that, deals with, that deal with this, uh, um, the concept of image, but there are only three in the book of Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 26, which was read for us this, this evening. Then Genesis chapter 12, uh, sorry, chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. And then Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 9, uh, verse 6. So to help me with clarity these past couple of weeks, as I have prepared for tonight, I've structured this talk on, on just a couple of questions. Uh, the first question uh, is this. What does it mean uh, to be created uh, in the image of God? And we've, we've heard a, a very clear biblical definition of it uh, from verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And then further down in verse 27, so God created man in his, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. The first chapter of Genesis teaches the uniqueness, the absolute uniqueness of the creation of man. While God created each animal According to its kind, verse 21, verse 24, and verse 25, only man was created in the image of God and after God's likeness. Uh, the Dutch uh, theologian Herman Bavink, uh, who, is, who is quoted quite a bit by uh, Anthony Ukama, uh, who wrote the book uh, uh, Made in the Image of God, is an early uh, 20th century theologian. He puts it this way, and I quote, the entire world is a revelation of God, a mirror of his virtues and perfections. Every creature is in his own way and according to his own measure, an embodiment of a divine thought. But among all creatures, only man is the image of God, the highest and the richest revelation of God, and therefore head and crown of the entire creation, close quote. We are created beings. We didn't fall from the sky or fall, fall uh, from, from anywhere else. We are created beings. But it goes further, the, te the, the teaching of Genesis, uh, the creation account goes a bit further. Uh, uh, the human being, uh, mankind is both a creature and a person. This, this now, as, as Anthony Wickham states, is the central mystery of man. He asks the question, how can man be both a creature and a person at the same time? You see, to be a creature means absolute dependence on God. It means that I cannot move a finger or utter a word apart from God. That's a creature. But to be a person means a kind of independence 
not absolute, but relative independent, independence as, uh, as one author, author states. So I can make decisions, I can set goals and, 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 and move in the direction uh, of those goals. To be a person means to possess freedom, to be able to make one's own choices. But to be a creature means that God is the potter and we are the clay. To be a person means that we are the ones who fashion our lives by our own decisions. So being created in the image of God means that we are both a person and a creature. So, so those, those two verses that, that, that look red for us, uh, 26 and 27, there are some very key words to note uh, in those two verses. The first word is image. An image uh, means to, to carve out, to, to cut out. And it really means to, to carve out, to cut out a representation of God and who he is. Likeness, the other big word, uh, in those two verses is to be like. So it's a representation of God who is like God. So image is to carve, to carve out a representation of God and likeness is to be like God, a representation of God who is like God. Then as we read on uh, um, uh, verse 28, the author talks there about uh, um, uh, us being uh, a part of being made in the image of God is that we have been given a job, uh, a job of dominion, of rule, which of course has implications on its own for the way that we use um, uh, this rule and this dominion or abuse this. And we know that we, we must give an account uh, of the way that we use or abuse uh, this role. We will be held responsible. In fact, as you read further on in the Bible, you, you, you get to the book of Romans chapter one, the apostle Paul deals with this. We are supposed to, uh, to have rule and dominion of a nature, etc., as created beings. But actually, we have worshipped created things instead of the creator of those things. So there's a great caution uh, for us in Romans chapter one. Despite the job that we've been given, we abuse it, we misuse it, and we will have to give an account for the way that we have used or abused uh, this dominion and this role. As we read further in Genesis, uh, uh, in fact, when we get to chapter two, another way we are like God is in our relationship uh, with others, uh, specifically towards the end of chapter two, the relationship between a, a man and a woman. Uh, marriage. Next week, the Lord willing, we will engage the topic of gender more. I uh, have to say that verse 27 is very clear about the creation of humanity, male and female, both bearing the image of God. For now, though, as Wayne Grudem uh, in the systematic theology, uh, he presents a very succinct definition here uh, for us. He writes, the fact that man is in the image of God means that man is like God and represents God, close, close quote. So we ought to reflect God. We ought to reflect his glory. We ought to reflect his character, his love, and his kindness. Uh, Tim Keller in one of his sermons says that we are like little mirrors capable of reflection. I mean, just, just ponder on that. We, as, as men and women created in the image of God, are like little mirrors, capable of reflection, capable of reflecting this great God who has created us in his image. So dear friends, to be described as made in the image of God and like God means that when we reflect him properly, we will represent him properly. We will reflect his glory, his goodness, his character, his love. We will reflect our, our creator, our relational creator. We will represent the glory of God. Of course, this then presents us with some implications. My second question this evening. So what does, 
what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What does it mean for us? A couple of things. It affects our self-image. I don't know when last you have heard this. When, when last you have heard someone say this to you. But here it is. You are special. You are very special. As you sit there uh, in, your, in your room, on your couch, uh, engaging, you are very, very special. No matter where you come from or where you've been, no matter how educated you are or how uneducated you are, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, whether you are rich, whether you are poor, every human being made in the image of God reflects God. And therefore, as one author puts it, there is a rock solid glory and value in every single human being. I mean, isn't that wonderful? Every one of us, within every one of us, there is a rock solid glory and value. Why is this so crucial? Why is this so very important? Well, because it is so because there is an intrinsic dignity and value and worth in every one of us. There is significance in every human being on the face of this earth. You see, the message of the Bible and the message of Christianity is that God does not make junk. So being made in the image of God, one of the implications is that it affects our self-image. But also it affects how we treat others. Um, now, uh, we, we come across people every day who, to be honest, we can do without. Yes, or am I the only one? We come across people every day who we can do without. People, people we don't get on with so easily. People who don't smell nice. People who we prefer to stay far away from. People that don't talk like we talk. But listen how, the, how James in his letter rebukes us in verse 9 of chapter 3. With a tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. He goes on to say, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. Dear friends, we need to treat every person with a sacredness, with reverence, with great respect, and with kindness, hard as it may be sometimes. You see, this made in the image of God is actually a radical doctrine. Let me ask you, as I've asked myself this past couple of weeks in preparation for this talk, how do you treat people? You see, it's something that we must consider. That leads to another implication. So it's, the, it's, it's, it's our self-image. It's the way we treat other people. And also the other implication is human rights, how we think about human, human rights. I remind you that human rights is not a social construct. It actually comes from the Bible. And hear this, hear this. It is meant to come to our society and our world through the church. It's meant to come to our world through us, the church. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. It says this, God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of, of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has his lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will demand an accounting. I'll demand an accounting from every animal. And from each human being, I too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. 
whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed for in the image of God as God made mankind. God is saying, I made them in my image and therefore they have rights. Here's the idea of the Imago Day. Throughout the Bible, we find that there are no levels in the image of God. You are not, or I'm not better uh, made in the image of God than what you are made in the image of God. The author of Proverbs tells us the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. The poor man and the oppressor meet together. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who's glad at calamity will not go unpunished. You see, there is no distinction, distinction in value here. God made both the rich and the poor. He made both the slave and the oppressor. And notice this. If you dishonor anyone made in the God's image, you dishonor God himself. If we dishonor anyone made in God's image, we actually dishonor God himself. You see, no human being, as James says, uh, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with, with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. There's a real danger of dishonoring those in God's image by sinning with our words. We must treat people, humanity, with great dignity and care in both word and deed. I think it is fair to say that some people don't make this connection between how we view people and how we view God. See, as a Christian, we must value people because we treasure our maker. So we don't sit idly by while others mistreat God's treasured position. You see, when we don't act on behalf of God's image bearers, we actually belittle God himself. Yesterday, the 4th of July, Day of Independence of America, I came across this quote. Uh, by Martin Luther King Jr. He couldn't allow the abuse of the Imago Day to go on without him acting. That doctrine, the, the image of God, drove much of the civil rights movement. So, so Martin Luther King fought for fair and just treatment of everyone, and he called out those who discriminate, discriminated against other races, against other eth ethnic groups. He said, and I quote, you see the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of the Imago Dei is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. Not that they have substantial unity with God, but that every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God. And this gives him or her uniqueness. There are no gradations of the, in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard, precisely because every man is made in the image of God. He goes on to say that one day we will learn that. We will know one day that God made us to live together as brothers and to respect the dignity and worth of every man. This is why we must fight segregation with all our nonviolent might. Close quote. Every human being. Every human being is worthy of, of human rights. And we can very easily interpret this quote from Martin Luther King into our own South African context. You see, if we don't consider some of these implications, dear friends, we will, we will lose our understanding of this crucial doctrine. So that brings me to the th a third question I want to ask. What happens when we do lose this, when we lose this understanding of the image of God. Well, we, we, we don't really lose it after the fall. The image of God is merely distorted. But when that happens, secular thinking will dominate. 
look with any with anything in life now right now uh, racism uh, uh, same sex marriages abortion idolatry of money and materialism with a distorted image we will approach we will approach that with the spectacles of this world secular thinking no regard for god instead of or through gospel lenses you see, that's a challenge for us. If we lose the image of God, if we, if we don't understand what it means to be made in the image of God, secular thinking will prevail. Like what happened uh, in the first century, uh, I read that in the Roman, uh, Greco-Roman world, that was the order of the day where abuse of human rights was so prevalent. Infanticide, was an acceptable thing. Babies were just left to die. There was a disregard for the mentally handicapped, for the elderly. If you didn't bring any worth or value to the to society, they would leave you. Slaves were ill-treated and left to die. But when Christians came along who understood the Imago Dei, they were the ones who started organizations like as we know today, the Red Cross Society, Salvation Army, shelters, hospitals, medical hospitals were started by Christians who understood the importance of the image of God. You see, if we don't believe in the image of God the way we should, we actually won't care for the unborn. We won't care for the newborn. The mentally handicapped will just be a, a stress uh, just an added pressure. We won't care about old and senile people. A couple of weeks ago, as I was deeply troubled by what engaged racism that session brought out, I wondered what our church, what the church at large would really look like if we took this doctrine very seriously. You see, we have, to be honest, we have to a large extent distorted the doctrine of the image of God. And that actually began at the fall of man. But it's not too late. It's never too late to be restored. So fourthly, the fourth question, how can it be restored? Or how has it been restored? You see, restoration becomes very, very critical for us in understanding of being made in the image of God. Our distorted image must be, it had to be restored. And how was that done? Well, it was done by the creator through his son, Jesus Christ, the image, the icon. Listen to how Paul puts it in Colossians chapter one, verse 15. The son is the image, the icon of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been, have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus says, Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So in order for, for, for this image to be restored, this distorted image to be restored, we have got to look at Jesus and gaze upon him so we can see the glory of God. Remember that, the, the, those marvelous words that Paul writes for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image. With Listen to this. With ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see. That is what's going to attract our hearts back to take hold of the image of God and the implications of it. 
when we are committed as we are to learn and to read and to study the Bible, we will gaze on the image of Christ and that will fix us. Jesus was poor. He was marginalized. He suffered un under human rights abuse. He was almost a victim of infanticide. He was trampled upon. Why? Well, he did so voluntarily. He did so to pay the penalty for our distorted image of God. He did it to restore our distorted image. When we see that, we see the glory of God in Christ because he is the image of the invisible God. You see, you are the image of God. Other people are also made in the image of God. So we must act like that is true. Let's pray before we go into a time of uh, Q&A. Will you bow with me as we pray? Father, we pray that you would teach us to think out the implications of the fact that one day in the ancient past, you said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, that they might reflect our glory, the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the world and bring life. Father, we confess that we are not imaging your glory as we should. We are not looking to you for our significance and our value. We tend to look to other things and as a result, we bring death instead of life into the world. We pray that you, would leave, that you would heal us with the image of your son dying on the cross, which shows us your glory in such a way that we can, have, that we can finally have our hearts healed. So that as the image of God is healed and restored in us, we can begin to honor it in others. Make us a church filled with people who speak graciously to one another. Make us a church that is so committed to the importance of human life. Make us a church that cares about the weak and the vulnerable and the marginalized. A church that cares about the powerless, cares about women and children, who cares about the people whom the world has rejected. Make us a church where we love each other and speak graciously to each other regardless of where we are from. Make us a church that understands the image of God because your son was conformed to our likeness on the cross of sinful flesh that we might be conformed to his like likeness forever and be made glorious as you are glorious. We pray this all in that name which is above every other name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Denzel. Um, I'm just wondering if you have sent a question through, because um, I haven't got one yet. Michael, have you got any questions coming through? Michael doesn't have any questions. Are there any questions still coming through? Denzel's quite excited about that because he doesn't like answering questions. Very, very excited. Very excited about that. <laughs> He's covered everything he had to cover. In fact, I will, I will just be that small little mirror and reflect it or deflect it. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds if you've got a question. Oh, it looks like Michael Temple's sitting forward. Yeah, there we go. Uh -huh, okay, so, so one of the questions, Denzel, and I think you, you might have to, um, is maybe just help us see again the tension between being both creature and person. Um, so one... Just, just help us to see that distinction again, the creature person. Um, you spoke about the creature having dependence. Uh, the person, do they have independence or how are they different? Well, uh, wait, let me quote you straight from, from Hukuma. 
Uh, so it was Mr. Hukamay that did it, not, not you. Yes, okay. yes, yes. No, I, I, I referred him, remember? Okay, yeah, no, no, go for it, tell us. Help us see. Man is not only a creature, however, he's also a person. Yeah. And to be a person means to have a kind of independence. Okay. Not absolute, but relative. So okay. it's a kind of independence. I mean, I, far better for me to take on the great uh, Hukama, but does he, does he explain what kind of independence that is? Well, I'll, well I'll, read it. I'll read the whole quote for you. Can I do that? Yeah. Because, you know, they are articulated much better than what I can. So, and to be a person means to have a kind of, in, a kind of independence, not absolute, but relative. To be a person means to be able to make decisions, to set goals, and to move in the direction of those goals. It means to possess freedom. Okay. At least right. in the sense of being able to make one's own, own uh, choices. So, okay. so look, remember when, when, I, when I was saved, my conversion um, on the 17th of October, 1993, there was a call made, an appeal from the altar was made. Even though I walked up to go get me my little booklet, actually it was the spirit of God. So, so the, the person heard uh, that I needed salvation, but it was actually the creature was was moved along to go to go respond. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So I think I think maybe just for clarity, um, when he uses the word independent, um, it's not it's not independent of God in that yeah. sense, because both as creature and person, we are dependent on God. Uh, but, but what he's saying is that we are able to exercise a freedom, exercise our will, exercise a conscious uh, in a way that animals can't. Yeah. And so in that sense, we, we are a creature, but we are a unique creature. And that's actually what, what bearing the image of God is about. It's, yeah. it's having the ability to, to be able to engage at, a, at an altogether different level. I mean, without being funny, we don't, we don't see the cats and the dogs sitting around over Zoom tonight engaging like this. Um, and that's because of our uniqueness. So, okay, I see what you're saying now. Okay. Uh, we've got another question. Oh, are you ready, Denzel? Here come now, Denzel. So, I'm just going to read it as it is. It says, seeing as the unborn are made in the image of God. And we dishonor God when we don't stand up for them. When will the church stand up against the millions of image bearers being murdered every year? Uh, so, so that's the question that you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, we. I I think that that because of, of our um, uh, the distortion of the understanding of the image of God. Maybe we are slow uh, in in standing up for for the unborn, um, um, and and maybe maybe you know a talk like this or a discussion like this can just wake us up so that we can we can actually start putting action in our in our belief, uh, adding deeds to our faith. Yeah. So. So I think, I mean, I think that's a great question, actually. And I think, I think there is an indictment on the church that we are very slow to address issues of justice across the board. We, we tend to cherry pick certain injustices over others. Um, and I, I think it is a huge question for us. Why, why are we not fighting abortion more than we do. Why are we not more vocal than we are? I don't know if Olivia will remember this, but um, we went to a conference in the States last year, two years ago. When, when did we go to Sing? Was it 2017? Sing 2017, 18, whenever we went to. And, um, and it was quite in incredible because for us to get to church on the Sunday morning, we actually had to walk past a picket line of, of a group of, of Christian abortion, anti-abortion people who were protesting the local church 
and were protesting the local church because of their silence on abortion, because they hadn't taken up arms against it. And I, I you know, it's a bit of a wake-up call. And, I, and Denzel, I think you're right. An issue like tonight, when we think about the image of God, you know, we, 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 we can't stop and be silent on these issues anymore. Um, so I think, you know, I think one of the issues that came up when we did uh, several of the engages earlier ago is, is which, which issues do we speak to? Um, there, are, there are more people who are killed in the womb than anywhere else in the world at the moment. It is the, it is the most dangerous place to be on this planet is in your mother's womb. And that's quite a frightening statistic. You know? So, yeah, so to the person who asked that question, I think it's a great question. I, I think it is an indictment on the church globally in the West that we, we ask more silent than we ought to be. I think it's a bit of a rebuke to us significantly. Um, and it might be that we've got to reflect on that. You know, at an established church like TCC, uh, we've got to think through how do, we, how do we respond to the issue of abortion globally and nationally, um, do we have a voice? Are we speaking against it? And also, look, uh, the, the, the person who asked that question, maybe that person can come and help us. Uh, yeah. uh, obviously, as I said in the beginning, there's always a question. I mean, I learned this from Graham uh, a couple of weeks ago. There's always a question behind the question. So yeah. maybe the, the person who asked that question can come come with us so that they can, they can show us yeah. uh, maybe a, a, a way to go forward. Yeah. in this thing because you're right it is such an indictment yeah. on the church of the lord jesus christ yeah. another great question coming uh, from from the chat room is um exodus 21 uh, anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death uh, is this pray the death penalty and how should we as christians interpret that um so can i refer them to the deuteronomy sermon that you preached <laughs> you can you yeah, can. Well, I've just done. I've just yeah. done that now. But but maybe you can give a a, a nice succinct answer. Or yeah. So so let me. I mean, let me rock the boat. Okay. Uh, let me upset the apple cart and and uh, shock some of you. I I think a right view of image is we should in an ideal world be pray the death penalty. Okay. Um, I think that's what he's just said in Gen the passage Denzel quoted from us from Genesis chapter 9, when God spoke to Noah. It was quite clear that if we value human life, uh, let me actually, so I was, I, I've got to a different passage because I was about to start another talk for us on Romans chapter 1, but that's, we'll say that for now. But come back to Genesis chapter 9. So it's, it's quite clear here. Uh, and for your life, blood, I will surely demand an accounting. I'll demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I'll demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by human shall their blood be shed. So, so the Lord tells us that he values human life so much that the willful, intentional, deliberate taking of another human life forfeits their right to life. And so I think that is the death penalty. Okay. So on the one hand, I would argue that we should be pro the death penalty because I think the Bible is pro the death penalty. And it's pro the death penalty because God has a right view of image. But and remember this little caveat I said earlier on? In an ideal world where we can have confidence in our justice system, when we can have confidence that our justice system will impose true justice. Uh, and so my theory is that we, we, by our track record, certainly in this country, by our track record, we show we cannot be trusted with the death penalty. Um, and we cannot be trusted because we abuse it and we use it as an excuse to kill innocent people. And so as much as on the one hand, I think we should uh, have the death penalty biblically, I think in terms of our own judicial frailties and weaknesses, uh, that would be a danger to us to have it at the moment. So, so I, I'm, I'm this kind of schizophrenic. I'm both pro the death penalty biblically, but I'm anti the death penalty judicially because I think, I think we, are, we are too fallen and broken.
to impose it, to impose the system properly. But uh, we did do a series on this in, in uh, we spoke about this in the book of Deuteronomy uh, last year, I think it was, so you could get those talks. Um, uh, how, Denzel, how can we be made in the image of God? Sorry, how can being made in the image of God be true and the total depravity of man also true? Um. Should, I, should I throw a stab at it? Yeah. Um, I, think, I think they can both be true. Um, in the sense that we don't lose the image of God when, when we sin. Uh, there is an intrinsic truth to us bearing the image of God. Yes, it's marred. Yes, it's tainted through sin. But we don't, we don't lose the intrinsic responsibilities to reflect God. We don't lose the intrinsic responsibility to rule and have dominion over the world. Uh, we don't lose the intrinsic responsibility to relate to each other properly. Those remain uh, true to us in terms of our creation. They're distorted by sin. And, and so we've just got to understand that, that the way we will reflect God and the way we will rule and have dominion and the way we will, will relate to each other has been tainted by sin. Uh, and that's actually what, what total depravity means. Total depravity doesn't mean that we are as wicked and evil as we can possibly be. Uh, what it means is that every part of us in totality has been distorted um, and differently in different ones, one, different of us, but it's been distorted by some, which means we've got to evaluate when we are ruling, are we ruling for selfish gain or are we ruling to honor God? When we are acting in a particular way? Do we have evil desires and motives or are we wanting to glorify God? Uh, it means what we must do. Total depravity says to us, I must constantly examine my heart as to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, and so I think, I think those two can sit together, that I'm still an image bearer, but I'm an image bearer tainted by sin, which means I've got, I've got to evaluate everything I do in light of the gospel, in light of Jesus, who is the true image. So, so I'm going to say, am I just doing this because I want to do this, or am I doing this because it would honor Jesus? So I think they can sit together. Um, okay, apparently there is a movie coming out soon called Unplanned, which is actually going to deal with abortion, uh, just for those of you who are interested. Okay, I think we've answered all the questions we've received online. I'm, I'm looking to Michael to nod or shake his head if he's got that. So he's nodding. Denzel, have you got any other questions that you want to ask or answer? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. All right. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to lovingly, because I'm, I, I'm such a nice guy, I'm going to unmute everybody for a moment, uh, hopefully. So you should be able to unmute yourselves now because I've unmuted you. I've given, I've given you the power to unmute yourselves, I think. Okay. All participants should be unmuted. Okay. If you are still muted, it's because you've muted yourself. Resident Brian, they still? Ken? Ken is not worried about us anymore, it looks like it. I, see, Ken's just waving from a distance. All right, so I'm just going to give you a chance to, to say goodbye to everybody. If you want to put your videos on before you go, guys, thanks very much for being with us. Thanks for coming along. Um, don't forget, next Sunday morning there'll be services, and uh, next Sunday evening we're going to actually have part two of image, which has to do with image as male and female in terms of gender. So it would be lovely for you to be with us. Okay, so everybody wave at your families, wave at your friends. Bye. 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 Thanks, Denzel. Cheers, Luke. Bye. 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 All right, guys. Have a good week. Lots of blessings. Bye. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye